sorry, we're in 1 Timothy chapter 6, and we're at the 10th and 11th verses, and uh, there's a lot to say on this subject, that's for sure. And last week we broached the subject about this, the love of money is the root of all evil. Now we've got quite a lecture on this, so I hope everybody <laughs> caught that last week so that you understood um, that the definite article is appearing here. So this is the root of all evil. It's not a root, like the modernists are trying to tell you it's a root, but there is no indefinite article in the Greek language. So definite article, the, not a. Now that's hard to understand because we would say, well, uh, money, the root of all evil? So, uh, so we did a little bit of etymology on some of the words here, and I hope you got all that last week, because I think it's, it's vitally important, and certainly the Bible, whenever it says something that uh, to you sounds, well, wait a minute, that must not be true, it's, there's something wrong with my thinking or your thinking. So it's not just the love of money per se, it's, the, it's lust, essentially, it's covetousness. If you wanted to reduce it to a single word, love of money is covetousness. <laughs> which is the original sin. Coveting is desiring to have something that doesn't belong to you. Adam and Eve wanted to uh, be God. So it didn't belong to them. And so they coveted after it. And so the expression here, the love of money, uh, in the original language could be, uh, if we wanted to translate it to a single word, avarice. And avarice is greed, but it also speaks of desire. Desire to have what's not yours. So it gets back to the sin of covetousness, essentially. And that's at the root of all evil, if one thinks about it. There's uh, whatever you're, you want, uh, and that's the problem. You know, God says no, but we want it anyway, and that's where sin comes into the matter. All right. So we spent so much time last week on that, so I, I had to make a bit of an apology. So what we have thereafter, and I have it underlined here, is, but thou, O man of God. Remember that uh, the pastoral epistles are written to... Uh, pastors in the case of Timothy and Titus, the next generation. And he's giving instruction about uh, how to carry the uh, word forth into the next century. So, uh, so here he's speaking to him as a man of God. Timothy is the pastor at Ephesus. He's been left there by the Apostle Paul. He's a young man, but he's mature in the faith. And so he's given here some instructions, but thou, O man of God, flee these things. Now, when it says flee these things, remember what 1 Corinthians uh, 6, flee fornication, run away from it. We think of Joseph, you know, and he was in that compromised position there with that desperate housewife, Potiphar's wife, you know, that old hag. And uh, she sees this young strapping guy and she's, uh, she wants to make love. And he, uh, he's in the wrong place at the wrong time. And there's, uh, so he has to flee out of there. He runs away and he leaves his cloak behind. Uh, and that becomes uh, her... Uh, uh, object to uh, condemn him. But uh, same idea, flee, run, run from it. So it's not casual looking away, it's a, it's a running away from it as far as you can. So in other words, the greed, avarice, has that kind of magnetic pull. Everybody wants more than what they have. Everybody, Nobody's satisfied with the things that they have. So you spent a good de deal of time last week about the word contentment. Godliness with contentment is great gain, First Timothy 6.6. 6. And in Hebrews 13, 5, uh, to be content with such things as ye have. So, and uh, the idea, and, and Jesus even said, uh, uh, to covet not after the things which a man possesseth. A life's, uh, man's life consisted not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. So the, uh, the notion of fleeing from it, that it has that kind of magnetic pull, and very dangerous at that. So, um, so be satisfied. But thou man of God in particular. And so the man of God must not be uh, interested in his, his salary. He's worried about what, how much money he has. And he wants to keep his money and so on and that sort of thing. And um, disqualifies him from ministry for that matter. It's an Old Testament problem as well. They had those in the Old Testament that Isaiah addressed as greedy dogs. So he says, yea, uh, they are greedy dogs. They can never have enough. Uh, they are shepherds that cannot understand. They all look to their own way, everyone for his gain from his quarter. Now that's, you know, it's amazingly uh, opposite to the day that we're living in. We have this all around us. We see it. 
it seems to be uh, the shibboleth of the modern church is to gain, to get gain. Not godliness, but uh, having, having wealth and having, uh, uh, you know, luxurious things. And that's what the Laodicean church will be. That's what it is. Uh, and so described there in Revelation chapter 2, or chapter 3, where because thou sayest I am rich and increased with goods, uh, and have need of nothing, uh, yet knowest thou not that thou art uh, wretched and miserable and poor, blind and naked. And so anoint thine eyes with eye salve is the advice that's given to them. But there's no hope for them. They have to be spewed out of the mouth of God. In other words, the Laodicean church is a lukewarm church. Now God uses the expression lukewarm. Lukewarm water is an emetic. And uh, if you drink it, uh, you, you want to spit it out of your stomach. It, it causes that kind of reaction. Uh, we have other things today that are uh, probably better than that. But uh, nonetheless, this is the picture that's given to us, a very, rather graphic picture of what we must say is the apostate state of the church. Uh, if I'm correct here in assuming that God has an underlying meaning in the seven churches and that he's speaking uh, in epochs of time, uh, and each of the churches seems to be characteristic of a specific time in church history, that would put us at the Laodicean age. Uh, and I don't know, how else can it be described? So we have that, and um, what's the problem? Well, the, what's being taught, what's being preached? Well, as far back as the first century we have in the book of Acts, one named Simon Magus. Uh, Magus uh, is more titular than actually his name. He is a magician and he uses sorcery and he uses devices uh, whereby he uh, gains his popularity and his income, by the way. Uh, so when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given. Now, Simon had the people under his uh, sway until the gospel reached them. And when the, when the gospel comes, it liberates people from superstition and from folly and from false doctrine. And so Simon kind of realized that his gig was up. And here was Peter coming in and uh, people were getting saved. And at this transitional period, they were imparting the Holy Spirit by the laying on of hands. And so, uh, and that was a temporal circumstance. Uh, we see in Acts chapter 10, it ends right there. The Spirit comes immediately upon those that believe without the impartation of the apostles' hands. But for now, that, that was the device that God had used. And so, um, when he sees this, he says, well, uh, let me buy that trick. That's a magic trick. And let me, let me see what I can pay for it. And so he says, give me also this power on whomsoever I lay my hands that he may receive the Holy Ghost and he offered the money. He thought somehow you could, you could pay for the blessing of the Holy Spirit. Sounds familiar. That you could actually pay for the power of the Holy Ghost or gifts from the Holy Spirit. Uh, and thus, uh, Peter said unto him, thy money perish with thee. Now, you know, he's not a good pope. He's not taking cash. I can tell you that right now. But... Thy money perish with thee, he said, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Now we all know better than this. And the Bible is explicit about the circumstance here with Simon Magus. So it's a lesson for all the ages to realize you cannot pay for the blessings of God. This is not a pecuniary matter. This is a matter, of course, the gift of the Holy Spirit is quite free, as a matter of fact. And so, uh, in our uh, lexicons and dictionaries over the period of time, there was developed then a word for this. And the word is simony. And it's named after Simon Magus. Simony. Now, I'm not sure if you've ever heard of this before. If you've come here for a number of years, you have, certainly. So, simony. So, simony is the buying or selling of ecclesiastical privilege. Uh, for example, buying pardons or benefices. So that's the idea of uh, what the Catholic Church does all the time in what's called an indulgence. In fact, uh, in a sense, this is what uh, gave uh, almost an explosive uh, power to the Reformation movement. It was the selling of indulgences. 
that seemed to be the breaking point, as it were. Uh, and uh, you see here, of course, in Vatican II, Vatican II was uh, written in the, uh, uh, by John Paul. Vatican I happened in the 60s, Pope John uh, the 23rd, and uh, some ra what they considered radical moves, you know, the Vatican I. Vatican II, of course, did nothing more in most cases than to affirm what had already been said. And uh, about the matter of indulgence, an indulgence is a remission before God of the temporal punishment <laughs> due to sins whose guilt has already been forgiven. Uh, the church which as the minister of redemption, dispenses and applies with authority the treasury of satisfactions of Christ. Christ is entrusted Peter and his successors, who are his vicars on earth, so that they may distribute it to the faithful for salvation. Now, one thing about the Catholic dogma is that it's written in such a way that you would have to be a Philadelphia lawyer to know what's being said. And so the common man reads it, doesn't really know what it means. But uh, anybody that would understand what they're saying here would, I think, be rightly indignant, recognizing here that the Pope has sovereign power now by, the, by purchasing power to actually bring the forgiveness of sins at a cost. You pay a certain amount, and uh, you can have your, your soul forgiven of cer certain sins. This is what an indulgence is. And the selling of indulgences is what actually ignited at least the German Reformation. We have this friar that comes under the authority of the Pope to sell indulgences. His name is Tetzel. And he comes to Germany, you know, and they, they have a parade that comes into town and Tetzel's there, you know, and the drums are beating and so on. And all the townspeople gather together to hear what Tetzel has to say. And he gives them the happy news that their, their loved ones that are burning in purgatory can be released simply by tossing a golden coin in the drum. And he even made a little advertising jingle that went along with that. You know, as soon as the coin is sounded in the drum, the uh, souls flee and, uh, from heaven, redound. So, uh, <laughs> I mean, it's outlandish. Now, the modern Catholic Church hides most of this. They don't want you to know this. This is bad publicity. So, and nonetheless, uh, there are people to this very day that still will purchase a Mass. Now, you would ask them, why are you purchasing the Mass? What's it, what does it do? I, I don't know. Maybe half of the Catholics understand what it means. They just think you're supposed to do it. They were told to do it, so they do it. Uh, if you showed them this, they wouldn't understand this. So uh, what are they doing? They're purchasing a mass that will, in turn, take so many years out of the uh, contract in purgatory for how many years you're there. Now, nobody knows how long anybody's in, in purgatory. And um, so it could be a thousand years. I mean, it depends on how bad they were on earth. These are those that have to pay for their venial sins. So... Uh, uh, nobody goes straight to heaven. You have to go to purgatory. So, you know, I've been to a number of Catholic masses and the, they gloss over all of this. And they speak about, you know, heaven and glory and so forth. But their doctrine says, no, no, no. People aren't in heaven. They're in purgatory. But they don't tell the people this in the mass. Because people would, uh, I think, be uh, uh, indignant towards it. They'd say, what are you telling me my loved one is in a place of fire and torment? Because that's what purgatory is. The fire is burning off their sins. Sins that are unpaid for. So somebody has to pay. Either the people on earth pay by buying a mass for $50. Or lighting a candle or some votive. Or maybe doing some kind of necessary work. And these are all, you know, indulgences can be granted according to what is done on earth for people that are in purgatory. But people in purgatory can't do a thing for themselves. So at the time, it was a, it was a, it was a great bargain. Selling indulgences at this point were plenary indulgences. Now the word plenary just means complete. So a plenary indulgence meant you could be forgiven for all of your sins that you've done before, that you're doing presently, and that you're doing in the future. Plenary means you pay one-time payment, 
and you're forgiven for all those sins. It sounded, what a deal. Not only that, the Pope said by his mercies that you could do it for loved ones too. So they're already in purgatory. So you can buy an indulgence for them. And I mean, really, as Martin Luther said, if, if the Pope had the power to release souls from purgatory for how much money for an indulgence, why doesn't he do it for free? Uh, nobody asked the Pope that question. In the meantime, of course, the Vatican is the wealthiest uh, corporation on the face of the earth. And uh, mainly because they don't deal with money, they deal with gold, they deal with land holdings that they confiscated during the Inquisition. They were thieves. They would take Protestants and they would uh, put them on the rack, insist that they deny Christ, uh, deny uh, uh, that uh, uh, their belief in Christ and, and ultimately the belief that salvation is in the church. They would have to confess that the Pope is the vicar of Christ and so on. And they'd have to give up everything that they believe. Uh, and, and most wouldn't. And as a result, then they lost their properties. They were considered heretics. And uh, their, their relatives were run out uh, and would live their lives in poverty. And the church then would assume uh, proprietorship of the properties. I mean, it's so dishonest. Uh, and that's the history of the church. And by the way, you say, you're making all this up, but it's in the Catholic history books. The Catholics will tell you their own history. It's well documented. Disgusting, wouldn't you say? Amen. And so to this day, of course, indulgence can... They, now you can buy them online uh, with your Visa or Master Charge, right? So there. So make sure you... Uh, and, and sometimes they have bargains like this. A 30-day Mass is for $90. You can't beat that. But we don't end there, of course. We have the multi-millionaire preachers today. I hope I have some of your favorite ones up here because uh, they're all multimillionaires uh, on television, that's for sure. And they'll say, well, we don't take a salary from the church. They don't need to, of course, because the church owns their mansions. $20 million mansion is where Joel Osteen lived. $20 million mansion. And uh, they'll say, well, they, this is the parsonage. And, you know, the, the church owns the airplanes that Kenneth Copeland had. He has eight airplanes, jet airplanes. And he's a pilot himself, by the way. And this evangelist needed a new one, so he was asking for a $54 million private air jet. And it was because he didn't want to be uh, uh, flying with uh, other people, you know. And he has to be, he's important. He has to be in places and so forth. And he's sure, he said, that if Jesus was living in this time, he'd be, he'd be uh, taking a jet airplane around, at any rate. Uh, so this is what the Bible is condemning in our text right now. And when it says that, but thou, O men of God, flee these things, run from them. Don't let them attach themselves to you, because it's what greed is all about, ultimately. Now, I've shown you this a thousand times, but I guess... When I was here for Woman Hour Loose, I did not expect to receive an offering. And the Lord gave me a word, Psalm 126. And the Lord spoke, everyone was to give $106, that when you sow in tears, you're going to reap with joy. If you put it in that, in that bucket, you're going to lose it. But if you put it in, in my hand, you're going to gain something from heaven tonight. If you're giving 1000 500 or 100 start coming down. Right now, come on, I want to lay my hand on your envelope. I want to lay my hand on your envelope. If you're not bringing the tithe, seriously, what, what, what are you expecting? <laughs> Just hang out at home, man, play golf. But the problem is, God wants to bless a lot of you. You're in the Jordan River. In your floaties splashing around thinking a mission trip will do it thinking another bible study will do it thinking serving in the church will do it 
thinking prayer will do it. It's all about the money. It's all about the money. Show me the money. You bring the devoted things to God, he'll bless the rest. If you don't, you're under a curse. I tell you, those cars weren't created for the devil and his kids. Those new nice cars were created for God and his kids. There's someone right now, you need to make a vow of $5,000. A thousand doesn't get your faith going. You could do a thousand. You need to make a vow of $5,000 and pay on it as God helps you. You need to do that. That's you. I see a lady right now that needs to make a vow of $5,000. Also, a business person needs to make a vow of $5,000. And Father, I ask you this morning for that one person to make a vow of $10,000 and pay it. God, I thank you that that person is watching right now, that you're speaking to that one right now for $10,000 and to pay it. Father, I thank you right now for that one that you have spoken to to make a vow and pay it immediately for $10,000. In Jesus' name, amen. And I told the Lord, whoever that is, that I would give away my favorite tie to whoever it is. It may not be this one, one of my other favorite ones. Satan gave me this mess. I mean... It's a lie of the devil. I shouldn't have said that. Don't you laugh at me. I know what I'm talking about. And he that touches me, puts his finger in the eye of God. I want to talk to you about the relationship between money and peace. Because I've heard people say, it's not about money. It's about peace. And it's about joy. And it's about love. It's about money. It's about money. Just let it, just let it fall at my feet. Look at that man taking all that money. Yep, listen to me, let's settle this. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Tithe is like having the key to put in the ignition of an automobile and to turn it on to be able to go. And if you take time to tithe the tithe correctly, it's impossible to go to hell. Because you're doing all of that, man, tithe will keep you in heaven. It'll keep you in the presence of God. You take time to tithe the tithe correctly, it's impossible to go to hell. Because you're doing all of that, man, tithing will keep you in heaven. It'll keep you in the presence of God. I want you to go to the phone, dial the number on the screen, and simply say, I'm one of the 1,000. I'm going to faith in somehow in 90 days a $1,000 seed. You may already have the 1,000. That $1,000 won't get you anywhere until God touches it. It is done in Jesus your thousand dollars cannot reproduce until it enters into a covenant with the soil you can put that thousand dollars just the other day, I was, I, I like new money. I don't know if you do, but I, I hate old money that's wrinkled and dirty and got all the diseases on it. I like new money. Most beautiful thing on earth is a $100 bill. I hadn't seen a woman as good looking as a $100 bill. And she, he said, we don't give to get something back. Oh, yes, we do. <laughs> oh, yes, we do. A man came to me and said, Brother Mike, when I give to God, I expect nothing in return. I said, I wrote a little song for you. How dumb thou art. How dumb thou art. Money! to me now! You wonder how they could attract thousands of people. It's just, uh, I don't, it's mind boggling to me. I, I, I can't figure it out. People can't be that stupid, but I guess we have them. So Jim, I think he was talking to you when he said somebody should make about ten thousand dollars. <laughs> all right, so that's a text, as you can see. Uh, what the Bible is very clear about all of this, uh, and it's a warning, as it were. Guess what? We're going to see it again in the uh, book of Titus. Where he says, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Okay, they make their gain by talking. Uh, there are many unruly and vain talkers, he says, deceivers. 
especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, who teach things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. So that's, uh, of course, lucre is kind of an archaic word for money. Filthy lucre's sake. Uh, oh, I don't know. There's more than we can name. I hope you see your favorite one in there somewhere. Uh, but they all have mega churches, and uh, they're, they're all multimillionaires. And uh, they do it on the backs of poor people, as a matter of fact. Well, we saw this text in Isaiah, but you'll see the thread that runs through the scripture uh, on this matter. Uh, we learned earlier in the first chapter about the uh, rules for the, the preacher of the gospel. He must be blameless, certainly, but not given to filthy lucre. And again, whose mouths must be stopped, we saw it in Titus, uh, for filthy lucre's sake. Peter says, uh, there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you that privily or secretly shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth is evil spoken of. And through covetousness, now we get back to covetousness, the, the expression love of money, covetousness, greed, avarice, they're really synonymous, the, the whole expression. Covetousness is a more generic expression for it. Shall they with feigned words, these feigned words, of course, is that they build people up. It's a, it's a, it's a, people go to these meetings because they're, they're given false hope and they're built up and they're told how good they are and so on. Very little about hell and sin. Uh, so feigned words, with, they make merchandise of you whose judgment now of a long time slumbereth not in their damnation, uh, slumbereth not. So Jude also, uh, I think Jude's up here. Woe unto them, for they have gone the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward and perished with the gainsaying of Korah. So uh, uh, all of this is Old Testament, but we remember uh, Balaam was, uh, he was attracted to Barak to uh, uh, curse God's people. Uh, Barak is the uh, king of Midian, and these are accursed people. But now they want, uh, they want to reverse the curse on the children of Israel. And they hire out this, uh, whatever he is, a, a false prophet, Balaam. And uh, he's ready to go and deliver the children of Israel, put a curse on them. And you know the story, I hope. Um, of course, Korah was one of the leaders of the rebellion against Moses in the wilderness. These are spots, Jude said, in your feasts of charity. The agape was the uh, communion table. When they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Just this week, this happens so constantly. I mean, there's <laughs> one pastor after the other, some story, and the liberal media loves to uh, magnify these stories. And uh, what they're saying is, oh, these Christians are all but hypocrites, that's all. Uh, they have a hard time with evangelicals. Uh, they thought for sure that they could uh, dissuade the evangelicals from voting for Donald Trump because of Donald Trump's, uh, he's a Bulgarian, we all know this, uh, immoral. Uh, so everybody knew, knew this and yet voted for him. And they're shocked at this. And of course, they want to consider Christians hypocrites because of this. Um, so, and of course, nobody, I don't, and I don't know any Christian is voting for him because of his moral, because he's a morally upstanding citizen. It's because his policies happen to agree with, with what we agree with. That's, that's the end of it. But every, uh, every, every week or so, they've got some new story about a pastor that fell, somebody, you know, uh, stealing money from the congregations and so on. This goes on ad infinitum. And I might add nauseam because it should never be. And it's primarily with people that have a big audience, the mega church, church guys and so on. This Colorado pastor accused of pocketing 1.3 million, you know, I have the article here, but it's written in, uh, I think the font is seven. So, <laughs> but um, he and his wife marketed the, their cryptocurrency uh, to Christian communities in Denver saying God told him people would become wealthy 
if they invested, the Colorado Division of Security said in a statement Thursday. Uh, Index Coin raised nearly 3.2 million, uh, the Securities Division said. At least 1.3 million of that went directly to the Rigaldos. I guess that's the, how you pronounce his name, Rigaldo. Uh, or was used for their own personal benefits, uh, the complaint said yesterday in a Denver County District Court. Uh, the Rigaldos could not to be reached for a comment, of course. You know. uh, out of the 1.3 million, half a million went to the IRS, they said. And a few hundred thousand went to home remodeling. The Lord told us to do this, he said. The couple also spent their investors' funds on a Range Rover, luxury handbags, jewelry, uh, and a pair. Anybody know what that is? A-U-P-A-I-R? What is that? It's a nanny. It's a nanny. Candy? Nanny. nanny. Somebody that watches your kids. I, st I still can't hear you. Well, you know what it is. Okay. Don't buy one. Are they expensive? <laughs> I don't know what. Boat rentals and snowmobile adventures couple were charged with violating anti-fraud provisions under the Colorado <laughs> Securities Act. Um, they're going to go to jail. They're going away. So sometimes, you know, you get a little bit of benefit. Good riddance. Because people like this give the gospel a bad name. And people like this guy. Uh, Whatever you do right now, don't you stop tithing. Mm. Don't you stop sowing offerings. Well, they won't let us go to church. Well, email it in there, text the gift. The Lord had already dropped in my spirit and in my heart several years ago, about three years ago, that the income of this ministry this year had to be $300 million. Thank God. And it is on file in heaven. It'll come in this year. Amen. It can't not come in this year. And there's no virus going to keep it from happening in my house or yours. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Wherever I go, God rules. When I walk on White House grounds, God walks on White House grounds. I had every right and authority to declare the White House as holy ground because I was standing there and where I stand is holy. <laughs> Spiritual advisor to President Trump. There's a Department of Treasury in heaven that God is watching over everything you do and you are storing up eternal treasure that will go so far beyond, I think, that we can even begin to imagine. You need to send in $3,500. You need to send in $35,000. You need to send in that $100,000 check. If you do not write that P.O. box and you do not call that toll-free number and you do not become a ministry of sustainer, you will never see sustainment in your life and your dream will die. Your call will die. So, disgusting. You, you, oh, you want that number again? <laughs> so all that is in the world, the Bible says, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. The world passed away and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Proverbs says, Wilt thou then thine eyes, uh, set thine eyes upon that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away as an eagle towards heaven. And uh, James says in the fifth chapter, Your uh, riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten, your gold and your silver cankered. So, um, as we move on in 1 Timothy 6, so charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, 
and willing to communicate. The Lord himself spoke about this uh, when he said, If therefore you have been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to you your trust the true riches? So uh, we better learn how to take the unrighteous mammon and do some good with it. Then, of course, uh, the Bible speaks about true riches in Ephesians. We, rich in mercy, for instance. The riches of his grace. The riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Uh, the unsearchable riches of Christ. This is what will endure forever. All right. So we move ahead in the 12th verse. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Whereunto you are also called and has professed a good profession before many witnesses. So that's the next part of the text and uh, a good one it is. Fight the good fight of faith. When we finally get to uh, what we have to consider his swan song, right, which is 2 Timothy. That'll be the last epistle that he writes. So you really have 1 Timothy, Titus, and then 2 Timothy. That's the order of the pastoral epistles. Um, when we come to the end of 2 Timothy, that fourth chapter, uh, we find uh, Paul saying, well, I fought a good fight. See, he, he's instructing Timothy, fight the good fight. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. So, so as he writes his final words to Timothy, he says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day. Not to me only, but also unto all them that love is appearing. So he speaks about finishing the course, and he's fought the fight. And at the end, he fought it lawfully. And he, he, uh, expecting a full reward before the king. So fighting the fight. Paul loved to use militaristic metaphors, imagery. Uh, <laughs> this isn't the only place. As you can see in 2 Corinthians, he uh, this passage, I think, so valuable to us there. Ten, chapter 10, verses 4 through 6. So for the weapons of our warfare are carnal, or not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Now you can see, you can almost feel the force of all this and the energy that's involved here, right? So you're fighting a fight. You're struggling. Now this all has to do in the spiritual plane. Um, you know, it was said of Martin Luther when he was translating the, the Latin Vulgate uh, into German so that the German people could actually read the Bible, the common man. Uh, he struggled constantly with uh, the very difficult matter of taking and producing a word-for-word -word, uh, translation. And it's not an easy thing to do because written originally in Greek, the New Testament, it would be difficult to bring over that into the German language or the English language or any other language for that matter. No easy task. And so he spent many hours. Of course, at this point, he had been locked up. You know, they, uh, they were after him. The Roman Catholic Church wanted to get him and burn him at the stake. And so he found refuge in Germany uh, under Frederick the Wise. And uh, they had him uh, holed up in a, uh, a vacant castle somewhere. And nobody knew where he was. And while he was there, he translated the Vulgate, the Latin Vulgate, the Latin New Testament, into German. But uh, uh, he frequently was so agitated because he couldn't find the proper uh, translation, the way to bring the German through, in, or, or the uh, Latin into the German. And um, so frustrated, he took his inkwell at one point. He believed the devil was troubling him. And he threw the inkwell against the wall. He thought he was fighting the devil, you know, and that the devil wouldn't bother him anymore. And they say there that uh, at Wittenberg, they still have the ink mark still on the wall, and people come to visit the castle and see the ink. At any rate, uh, our battle should be really that real at times. We should recognize, and we don't often, because, you know, we're just exasperated with the circumstance without realizing, you know, the devil's in the details of this. And uh, we're fighting the devil all the time uh, with people and with the 
church services and sickness and uh, you name it. You know, all these things that the devil throws up as obstacles. Getting in the way of the work of the Lord. That's, that's what he's about. He's the great agitator. So uh, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness. Well, you know the panoply of God. It's a simple text there in Ephesians 6. Very similar to this. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God. To the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that, see, we're wrestling in the mind and the thoughts and so forth. And casting down these imaginations. And these things that exalt themselves against God. This is who the devil is. He exalts himself against God. He, uh, as God, sits in the temple of God, saying that he is God. So uh, we bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience. Now we're talking about actually taking the offensive here. You know, up to that point we're defending, you know, and uh, casting out and getting the getting the devil out of our, our lives. But now we have to take the offensive here and take revenge on him for what he has uh, plotted against the kingdom of God and his people. So, uh, indeed, having a readiness to revenge all disobedience so that when your obedience be fulfilled. So the notion here again is that we've got a battle on our hands here. It will be later in 2 Timothy that we have uh, a similar thought. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And no man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. I've, I've given the, the lecture many, many times here. But we get involved uh, uh, and get so worked up about things that are happening in this world. And we forget we're pilgrims here. We don't really belong here. And part of our frustration is simply... We're, we're, we're kicking against something that, that can't be changed. It's irre, irreformable. It, you know, when I, uh, I say, look, the history of the true church, the true church never was a part of the Catholic Babylon church. There were always groups of people, small as they may be, but, but groups of independents that had nothing to do with their formal religion. They followed the Lord. They followed the scriptures. And so we have them through history, throughout time, but they've always been in the minority. They've never been a big movement, never will be, as a matter of fact. So, uh, and they, uh, through the ages of time, they've had to fight the good fight for 2,000 years. So this isn't just something peculiar to our generation. So, um, uh, but we don't want to be involved in what's happening here and now. And we get all worked up about things. And really, at, at the end of this, uh, God is, he, we know the end of the story. The Lord's coming back with his kingdom. And uh, he'll rout all of that which is now disobedient. And all the rebels will be uh, carted away down to hell. And uh, Satan himself will be put in the pit. So, uh, I mean, we know the end of the story. So what should we be doing in, in the meantime? Now, it was years back uh, we had somebody, in fact, I... Uh, Met him in the jail, and he uh, uh, seemed to be uh, a real Bible student, and he was. And um, he said, oh, when I get out, I've got to go to your church. And I said, well, certainly, you know. And he came here for quite a while, and he was a good member here, and he enjoyed the teaching and so on. We then entered into a um, political season, and um, at that time, Romney was running for president, you'll recall, against uh, Obama. And... Uh, he, he kept coming up to me and said, uh, he said, you're, you know, you're not saying much about uh, supporting Romney. I said, well, I'll, I'll be voting for him. He said, well, you don't seem to be, you know, encouraging. I said, well, how can I? I, 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 can't, I, I can't encourage uh, voting for him. I, I never believed he was a, a true conservative. And he was like shocked. And uh, he was involved politically with the political group in New Kensington, I think. And... Uh, uh, he was so, he was upset with me and angry. And uh, he wanted to form little action groups here and so forth and support groups for Romney. I said, well, it's not going to happen. I said, um, for all these years, I've held my nose and voted. And um, I never believed for one minute that there's going to be some hero that shows up on a white horse 
and he's going to make everything better for us politically. Uh, now, for how many years have we said, all we need is a conservative and we're going to overturn Roe v. Wade? But I knew from, well, I don't know, not from the beginning necessarily, but I knew that that wasn't really going to change much. You know, because people with simple teaching think that's all we need to do. Uh, you, know, you don't understand what, what the Supreme Court is saying, essentially, is it's not constitutional. And, and they're just going to throw it right back to the states. And then you're going to have liberal states like Pennsylvania. And, uh, you know, it's open season for killing babies here. And, and, and it's going to continue like that. So what we were thinking, oh, you know, that's all we need. And, you know, it's like a panacea. All we need is Jesus to return to the earth. That'll solve our problems. Now, in the meantime, we live in a republic. You have a responsibility and you better vote and ought to vote as a Christian should vote. And you need to vote for the person who is least evil and least corrupted uh, and holds what we believe to be Christian values. And, and that's, the, that's the best we can do. And it won't be for long because even if they get into office, they'll be thrown out of office at some point. You know, there's term limits and whatever else, except for the senators. You know, it seems like they can go on forever, right? <laughs> so, so what do I say? Don't get all worked up now. Just remember, we're believers here. Now, the agitators are on the radio 24 hours a day, stoking the flames, Fox News and so forth. It's a, they make multiplied millions of dollars doing, the billions of dollars doing this. And they massage, you know, and get people worked up about things. And, so, and the best thing for us to do is remain aloof. We're praying for our country. We pray for revival. Revival is what will save this country. Christians acting like Christians. Uh, and I mean, really meaning it and living the way Christians ought to live. We're the salt of the earth. I'm not counting on the Senate to do it. I'm counting on believers. We're the hope. Um, and uh, what hope? At the end, the Bible speaks that evil men will wax worse and worse. And that's what's happening. I'm not shocked by it. Uh, I'm disappointed, and I think that the believers should have more of an influence than they do. But our influence essentially is one on one. The best thing we can do is win people to Christ and uh, let the Holy Spirit live in them, and then the truth will come to them, and they'll see the difference, and then they'll know how to vote, so to speak. All right. So he says, fight the good fight of faith, but lay hold on eternal life. Now, laying hold, uh, this is a, it's a very strong, uh, in the original language, very strong concept here. It's grasping something and not letting it go. <laughs> lay hold. <laughs> so, you got to lay hold on it. Hold it like that. Hold it like you hold a $20 bill. Some, uh, no, I mean, you've got to grasp it, right? So, the notion is that the devil's going to try to take it out of our grasp. And you know that. He's a thief. Jesus said that's, that, that's what he does in John chapter 10, that he's a thief. Uh, the, uh, the wolf comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. That's what he, so he's a thief. And so he's going to take, if he can, he's going to take your power away. If he can, he'll take your hope away. If he can, he'll take your convictions away from you. That's what, that's what he's all about. So we have to hold fast. And you hold it, and you don't let it go. You say, I believe this, and I'll never let it go. Amen. And that, the whole purpose of coming to church is to be reinforced in that truth. Amen. Say, well, I know I believe that, but now you know, I'm, I, I, I'm holding it again even tighter. And, and to make you aware of what the devil's trying to do, and what his machinations are, and how he's all, at all times trying to compromise the believers, is to make them lukewarm, is to make them uh, so that they're not an influence of any kind. We're the light of the world. Uh, and what a pathetic light it is. So lay hold on eternal life. Now it says in 1 Thessalonians 5, cleave to that which is good, right? So uh, quench not the spirit, despise not prophesyings, hold fast that which is good, cleave to that which is good. And that's the notion of it. Holding faith, he says to Timothy earlier, and a good conscience which some having put away concerning the faith their shipwreck, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. So uh, you've you got to hang on. 
Hold on. And don't let the devil take it from you. Titus, he says the same thing. Holding fast, faithful words as you have been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. So holding fast the word. Well, you have to know it first of all. You, you have to read it. And, uh, you know, it's no easy task. Reading through the Bible is a hard task. If you've never done it, uh, it depends. I mean, if you're a new believer, it's, it's, uh, that's a, it's a daunting task. But if you've been saved for, what, five years? You should have certainly read through the Bible at least one time in your life. And I would suggest reading it through every year. Uh, but you'll, you'll, you'll find some hard places and so on, hard to get through and whatever. Uh, so if you're finding a lot of difficulty with it and comprehension, then I, I would just read the New Testament and just pour over the New Testament. But you're going to miss a lot. But still, you've got to know it. If you're going to hold fast, you'll have to know what you're holding on to, as a matter of fact. So cleave to that which is good. Uh, let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck and write them upon the table of thine heart. So, uh, Now this is not telling you to go get a tattoo of a scripture. Uh, he's talking about something quite spiritual, right? He's not talking about getting a necklace with the, with the word on it. Uh, Jews took this, you know, to, to mean that you, they, they made leather phylacteries and they would wrap them about their neck, you know, and they had a little compartment and they'd open them up and there'd be a scripture in it. Uh, and they wrapped them around their, their arm and their heart. And uh, so they took it literally. But uh, now God wants it actually to be uh, impressed within us. Uh, James speaks about receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save the soul. Engrafted. Uh, skin graft, you, it becomes part of you. Skin graft, you know. Now, now we're taking the word and we're grafting it. It becomes a part of us. And uh, it'll never leave us uh, until we get uh, uh, Alzheimer's. How's that sound? You counting on that? Dementia. So that good thing which was committed unto thee, keep. See, so we've got to hold on and hold fast to it. And the hope in Hebrews, but Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope uh, unto the end. So, so fight the good fight of faith, he tells Timothy. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called. And has professed a good profession before many witnesses. Uh, well, we're, we're out of time, so we'll get to this perhaps next week. But all of us should be able to say, yes, I've made a good profession before many witnesses. They might not have received your word, but be satisfied that you did what you're called to do. We're not called to save people. We're called to bring the message. That's all. We're ambassadors. We're representing the king. And we bring the word from the king. And what people do with that is their problem. Their free will is exercised one way or the other. Now, Lord, uh, I pray that we take all of this to heart because there's nothing in the scripture that's put there to take up space. It's all instructional. And I pray that we'll learn much from it and that our lives will reflect that truth. Now, remember us with your blessings here, Lord. Uh, help us not to be drawn away by the lust of the flesh and lust of the eyes by covetousness, by the love of money, by things, Lord. I have to remember that uh, we're pilgrims here and we won't be here for long. So we look for your uh, continued blessing upon us, Lord, and that you'll help us to accomplish your purposes and that you'll make us a good witness, that we'll give a good profession before many witnesses. In Jesus' name, amen. We invite you to accept the plan of salvation that God has laid forth from the foundations of the earth. And the first point of that plan is that all have sinned. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. So begin by confessing your sin before God, that you have sinned against Him. and You can't even recollect all of the times that you've offended Him. He has the record. 
and that record needs to be expunged. Secondly, it's important to know that God will punish sin. If it goes without atonement, we will pay the ultimate price. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that eternal price is hell, fire, and brimstone. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. But Jesus paid the price and made the atonement on the cross. God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, much more than being now justified by his blood. We shall be saved from wrath through him. When Jesus died, he said, it is finished. He made an end to our damnation and our debt that we owed to him, paid by his own blood and justifies us before a holy God. On the third day, in triumph, Jesus rises from the dead. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So call upon him today. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Come in to stay, come in to